Canoeing. Canoeing is an ancient mode of transportation, a modern recreational sport, and a means of accessing nature that no motorised forms of boating can match. I love nature, I love the outdoors, and I've had a lifelong desire to access the wilderness, to be closer to the ecology that supports life on this planet. Water is at the heart of that life, the lifeblood of nature that runs the course of her rivers, lakes and seas. Now was the time to launch on a trip with a new friend, Laurie. A canoe trip which I had been planning for a while, a 30 kilometre adventure and overnight camp in the Norfolk Broads, a wetland habitat like no other. Beginning at the northern tip of the Broads near Stalham, the route was counterclockwise on three rivers, the Ant, Bure and Thurn, and would cross the two largest broads, Barton and Hickling. An adventure into East Anglia's last wilderness. We set off bright and early on a beautiful day in early May and waved goodbye to civilization for 24 hours. My canoe was packed with my camera set up to capture what I hoped would be a memorable adventure. I also had my tent, a large rucksack and the wood for a campfire. It wasn't long before we left the marina behind us and entered the River Ant, which looked every bit Amazonian to my eyes. The tree boughs leaning into the river obscured the bank with their springtime foliage. Species include alder, birch, hawthorn, but particularly willow, which thrives along the riverside. Where the bank revealed itself, a male mallard with iridescent plumage greeted us with his quack. Laurie had packed a large military style rucksack and was using a waterproof container for much of his cooking equipment. He was in his 15 and a half foot western canoe. Dugout canoes have been used by many peoples over the millennia often by carving out a single piece of wood, either a hole or part of a large trunk. Our canoes were made from marine ply, epoxy coated and varnished. The word canoe came into the English language from the Spanish Portuguese word canoa. They in turn had adopted the word from the Arawakian languages of the Caribbean for the dugout canoe, canoa. The oldest known canoe dates over 10,000 years ago and was found in the Netherlands. Much of the broad waterways are framed by the golden brown mature reeds or rush sedges. This year's new growth could be seen as a green band emerging from the water level. Similar to grasses but much more ancient, these plants evolved in wetlands over 160 million years ago. Reed and sedge have been harvested from the broads as part of a lively rural economy for centuries, used mainly for thatched roofs and fencing. The Norfolk Broads is a network of mostly navigable rivers and lakes in the English counties of Norfolk and Suffolk. 
It covers an area of 303 square kilometers, most of which is in Norfolk, with over 200 kilometers of navigable waterways. There are seven rivers, the Ant, Bure, Chet, Thurn, Waveney, Wensum, and Yare. Broad authority barges and craft can often be seen transporting equipment, particularly associated with dredging and bank management. The Broad Authority was set up in 1989. Willow management is particularly important. Their roots bind and provide a coherent structure to the riverbanks. Their branches often require cutting as they encroach on the waterways. As the morning progressed, so did we, as we reached the first broad on our travels. Barton Broad is looking magnificent. Dappled in sunlight. The lakes, known as broads, were formed by the flooding of peat workings. Thirteen broads are generally open to navigation, with a further three having navigable channels. Exiting Barton Broad, we followed the river and through some shallows and around a turn at Ersted, where we saw some beautiful thatched buildings on stilts. With a garden wind chime that glistened in the spring sunshine, as did the water surface. Just before midday, we decided to branch off the main river Ant into a canal dike 
where it's prohibited for motorcraft to venture. Here, we briefly felt truly engulfed in nature. After our little excursion, we re-entered the main river at Howe Hill and saw the traditional wooden sailing craft that used to be more common in years gone by, with a large rudder and red ensign. We moored up at the stave and prepared lunch with the most pressing of issues for an Englishman, that being what type of tea we should drink. So Laurie, what do you fancy? English breakfast tea by Twinings or PG Tips? Have we got any water? Departing Howe Hill after lunch, we paddled past the Turf Fen drainage mill. Drainage mills were used to pump water in order to help manage the land. We would see many more of these disused buildings along the way. This part of the river is almost five rivers as the drainage dikes run parallel to the main river as we approach Ludden Bridge. After Ludden Bridge, we travelled through open land towards our next river, the Bure. Turning into the Bure was like peeling back the years. Reed stacks stood in traditional wigwams and another broad sailing yacht. As the yacht passed me, I could hear a cutting through the water and see beyond the remains of St. Bennet's Abbey. A grey heron with a fish. A 
cormorant. An easterly wind was building and we decided to edge nearer to the bank side to shelter. We navigated into the Thurn River, against the flow. More windmills became apparent. Thurn is a small village with an iconic drainage mill known locally as Morse's Mill. The village's name means thorn bush. The mill has been renovated in recent years and may be visited at certain times. By Reeves and Basswick, the wind had picked up to over five knots headwind. It became a real struggle to paddle. The flags buffeted and even the ducks decided to keep close to the shore. At Potterheim, we could see the medieval bridge with its arches. Lorry was first to pass under. This is the location of many a poorly judged height by motorcraft and holiday boats that regularly crash into the old bridge due to insufficient draft. Damage to the bridge was evidenced by score marks. Thanks to Daniel Bernoulli, an 18th century Swiss mathematician, I knew the principle that fluids flow quicker through a constriction was true. The Bernoulli principle. The water rushed around the bridge buttresses and hampered my passage, and I had to push my way on the bridge side to assist getting through. The next few kilometres were paddled with determination as my tired muscles battled to keep me going. Thank goodness for that. What a difference as soon as you get out of the wind. Oh, I am achy from neck down to waist. It just seemed like such a long way, I think. Just up here, it's not far. Turning into Candle Dyke, we arrived at our wild camp location on the river bank near some moorings. That was a bit of a struggle at the end there, but we've made it to camp, got the fire going, and we're gonna have a drink, Copperberg cider. <laughs> to the 300 miles against the storm. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Cheers, Ollie, that was a good effort. <laughs> I 
never believe Andrew's estimates on distances. <laughs> no, I really like that. I think that uh... there were several, but they had the mesh on that on that, and that company does them in different sizes. That's a small one, yeah. but they didn't have the other sizes available when I ordered it. I think that's okay. I think that's really good. I like the idea that yeah, you've got that grill above the fire. Yeah, so you can feed it. Feed it. Yeah. Theoretically, yeah. Small, yeah. it's yeah. wood. And you can move it around for different parts of the heat. It's quite a large surface. The morning dawned to a golden sunrise. The wind tickled the water surface and rustled the reeds. Marsh and reed warblers chanted. Surtees warblers chorused. Finches and a wren sang. We awoke early in this bird kingdom. We packed up our gear and ensured that we left absolutely no trace on the riverbank and headed north through Heim Sound. This was probably my favourite part of the trip. The conditions were ideal. Laurie and I chose different routes across the sound and enjoyed soaking up the atmosphere. Birds, sunshine, peace and isolation. in a tree. Look carefully for the heron, looking more like one of those plastic garden ornaments as he fished the river bank. Our final effort was to cross Hickling Broad, the largest of the Norfolk Broads, populated by many species of birds, and I was delighted to see a flock of swans.
We contemplated which way was best across the broad, but as there was nobody else about, we decided to head straight across. As we are arriving at our destination, the stay at the Pleasure Boat Inn, Hickling Heath, we had covered 30 kilometres and experienced a wonderful landscape and an environment which requires protection and respect, the Norfolk Broads. <laughs> 